She slept but a few hours. They were troubled and feverish hours, disturbed with dreams that were intangible, that eluded her, leaving only an impression upon her half-awakened senses of something unattainable. She was up and dressed in the cool of the early morning. The air was invigorating, and steadied somewhat her faculties. However, she was not seeking refreshment or help from any source, either external or from within. She was blindly following whatever impulse moved her, as if she had placed herself in alien hands for direction, and freed her soul of responsibility. Most of the people at that early hour were still in bed and asleep. A few, who intended to go over to the Chenier for mass, were moving about. The lovers, who had laid their plans the night before, were already strolling toward the wharf. The lady in black, with her Sunday prayer-book, velvet and gold-clasped, and her Sunday silver beads, was following them at no great distance. Old Monsieur Faraval was up, and was more than half inclined to do anything that suggested itself. He put on his big straw hat, and, taking his umbrella from the stand in the hall, followed the lady in black, never overtaking her. The little negro girl who worked Madame Lebrun's sewing-machine was sweeping the galleries with long, absent-minded strokes of the broom. Edna sent her up into the house to awaken Robert. "'Tell him I am going to the Chenier. The boat is ready. Tell him to hurry.' He had soon joined her. She had never sent for him before. She had never asked for him. She had never seemed to want him before. She did not appear conscious that she had done anything unusual in commanding his presence. He was apparently equally unconscious of anything extraordinary in the situation. But his face was suffused with a quiet glow when he met her. They went together back to the kitchen to drink coffee. There was no time to wait for any nicety of service. They stood outside the window, and the cook passed them their coffee and a roll, which they drank and ate from the window-sill. Edna said it tasted good. She had not thought of coffee, nor of anything. He told her he had often noticed that she lacked forethought. "'Wasn't it enough to think of going to the Chenier and waking you up?' she laughed. "'Do I have to think of everything? As Léant says when he's in a bad humour. I don't blame him. He'd never be in a bad humour if it weren't for me.' They took a short cut across the sands. At a distance they could see the curious procession moving toward the wharf, the lovers, shoulder to shoulder, creeping, the lady in black, gaining steadily upon them, old Monsieur Faraval, losing ground inch by inch, and a young barefooted Spanish girl, with a red kerchief on her head and a basket on her arm, bringing up the rear. Robert knew the girl, and he talked to her a little in the boat. No one present understood what they said. Her name was Mariaquita. She had a round, sly, piquant face, and pretty black eyes. Her hands were small, and she kept them folded over the handle of her basket. Her feet were broad and coarse. She did not strive to hide them. Edna looked at her feet, and noticed the sand and slime between her brown toes. Baudelet grumbled because Mariaquita was there, taking up so much room. In reality, he was annoyed at having old Monsieur Faraval, who considered himself the better sailor of the two. But he would not quarrel with so old a man as Monsieur Faraval, so he quarrelled with Mariaquita. The girl was deprecatory at one moment, appealing to Robert. She was saucy the next, moving her head up and down, making eyes at Robert, and making mouths at Baudelet. The lovers were all alone. They saw nothing. They heard nothing. The lady in black was counting her beads for the third time. Old Monsieur Faraval talked incessantly of what he knew about handling a boat, and of what Baudelet did not know on the same subject. Edna liked it all. She looked Mariaquita up and down, from her ugly brown toes to her pretty black eyes, and back again. "'Why does she look at me like that?' inquired the girl of Robert. "'Maybe she thinks you are pretty. Shall I ask her?' "'No. Is she your sweetheart?' "'She's a married lady, and has two children.' Oh, well! Francisco ran away with Silvano's wife, who had four children. They took all his money and one of the children and stole his boat. Shut up! Does she understand? Oh, hush! Are those two married over there, leaning on each other? Of course not! laughed Robert. Of course not! echoed Mariaquita, with a serious confirmatory bob of the head. The sun was high up and beginning to bite. The swift breeze seemed to Edna to bury the sting of it into the pores of her face and hands. Robert held his umbrella over her. 
as they went cutting sidewise through the water, the sails bellied taut, with the wind filling and overflowing them. Old M. Faraval laughed sardonically at something as he looked at the sails, and Baudelaire swore at the old man under his breath. Sailing across the bay to the Chenier Caminada, Edna felt as if she were being borne away from some anchorage which had held her fast, whose chains had been loosening, had snapped the night before, when the mystic spirit was abroad, leaving her free to drift whithersoever she chose to set her sails. Robert spoke to her incessantly. He no longer noticed Mariequita. The girl had shrimps in her bamboo basket. They were covered with Spanish moss. She beat the moss down impatiently, and muttered to herself sullenly. "'Let us go to Grand Terre to-morrow,' said Robert in a low voice. "'What shall we do there?' Climb up to the hill to the old fort, and look at the little wriggling gold snakes, and watch the lizards sun themselves." She gazed away towards Grand Terre, and thought she would like to be alone there with Robert, in the sun, listening to the ocean's roar, and watching the slimy lizards writhe in and out among the ruins of the old fort. "'And the next day or the next we can sail to the Bayou Brulo,' he went on. "'What shall we do there?' "'Anything. Cast bait for fish. No. We'll go back to Grand Terre. Let the fish alone. We'll go wherever you like, he said. I'll have Tony come over and help me patch and trim my boat. We shall not need Baudelaire nor any one. Are you afraid of the pirogue? Oh, no. Then I'll take you some night in the pirogue when the moon shines. Maybe your gulf spirit will whisper to you in which of these islands the treasures are hidden, direct you to the very spot, perhaps. And in a day we should be rich," she laughed. I'd give it all to you, the pirate gold and every bit of treasure we could dig up. I think you would know how to spend it. Pirate gold isn't a thing to be hoarded or utilized. It is something to squander and throw to the four winds, for the fun of seeing the golden specks fly. We'd share it, and scatter it together," he said. His face flushed. They all went together up to the quaint little Gothic church of Our Lady of Lourdes, gleaming all brown and yellow with paint in the sun's glare. Only Baudelaire remained behind, tinkering at his boat, and Mariequita walked away with her basket of shrimps, casting a look of childish ill-humour and reproach at Robert from the corner of her eye. 